Well, Fesca Mao Ludunia's Falcha, good afternoon everyone and welcome. Uh, this is the sixth meeting of the Justice Subcommittee on Policing of 2018. Uh, we have no apologies. Our colleague Liam MacArthur is in the chamber at the moment uh, debating a constituency issue, uh, my constituency as well, so hopefully he's debating it well. And Liam will join us at, at some point. Um, um, now, agenda item uh, one is a decision on taking business in private. Um, that's item, item three in private, which is a discussion on the subcommittee's work programme. Are we all agreed on that? Agreed. Thank you very much indeed. Agenda item two is the Police Scotland's proposed use of digital device triage systems, um, and uh, more commonly referred to cyber kiosks. And I refer members to uh, paper one, which is a note by the clerk, and paper two, which is a private paper. And I welcome to the committee Detective Superintendent Nicola Burnett, uh, Police Scotland and Kenneth Hogg, Interim Chief Officer, Scottish Police Authority. And I thank the witnesses for their written submissions as ever. That's very helpful. And uh, as it's Mr Hogg's first appearance before the subcommittee, I invite him to make a short opening statement, following which we'll move to questions. Thank you, Mr Hogg. Thank you, Convener. I'm pleased to have the opportunity today to contribute to the subcommittee's discussions for the first time since taking up my role as Interim Chief Officer at the Scottish Police Authority. The Authority has been briefed by Police Scotland at various stages about its proposals to use cyber kiosk devices. That engagement has been part of the Authority's oversight of the delivery of the policing 2026 10 year strategy. The kiosks are one of 70 initiatives which comprise that wider programme of change. The Authority has asked Police Scotland about implications for data handling associated with cyber kiosks. A key assurance which has been provided by Police Scotland is that this new technology does not extend the powers which the police already have in relation to accessing information on mobile phones. Instead, it lets officers carry out what they already do more quickly and more locally. Public interest in the handling of personal data is of growing importance to policing as it adapts to working in an increasingly digital world. The SPA is therefore increasing its oversight of these issues, including through its scrutiny of an integrated digital data and ICT strategy, which is being developed by Police Scotland. More generally, the SPA is also undertaking <coughs> a comprehensive programme of improvement in its own ways of working. That includes being able to better scrutinise Police Scotland's delivery, of their change and modernisation programmes and to shine a light on issues that are of public interest. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much indeed for that, Mr Hogg. Um, I'm going to start the questions and I'm going to refer to a submission this committee had um, at the time that we were looking at the Police Scotland Standing Firearms Authority. And at that time, uh, Mr Ian White, who was a board member, addressed the committee and indeed in the submission to that to our committee we heard and I quote one of the principles of good governance is that, that the public voice is appropriately heard within decision making and in relation to that particular issue the SPA stated that one aim of the SPA's inquiry was to assess and again I quote what if any lessons might be learned about how operational decisions with wider strategic and community impact are communicated to national and local oversight bodies and other key issues. Are you able to outline, Mr Hogg, indeed, uh, Ms Barnett, the public engagement that's been on this issue, please? The proposals to introduce cyber kiosks are part of, um, in the first instance, a national cyber crime technical strategy, and that in turn forms part of the policing 2026 10 year strategy. There has been public engagement round about the overall strategy, specifically on the issue of cyber kiosks. The SPA has had conversations with Police Scotland at various stages um, over the last several years about the development of this. Some of those um, have been in public and some of those have been in, in private session. You'll understand that this is very much in the public domain now. <coughs> Are you able to say how much has been spent on this particular initiative, please? Yes, the purchase of the 41 cyber kiosks themselves um, comes to a total of £445,000, including VAT. 
that includes the cost of licenses and of training that goes along with that. There's, in addition, there will be an ongoing annual revenue cost of £100,000 a year associated with their use. Are you able to explain, indeed, yourself, Ms Burnett, uh, what an evidence management system support, um, which I understand is a contract awarded to a company called Abbott Informatics, is about, please? I'm so sorry, could you repeat that? Could yes. You know? um, um, the term evidence management system support and maintenance, which is a contract worth £431,000 provided by Abbott Informatics, how it relates to the issue that we're discussing, please. Uh, convener, I, I can probably answer that question. Um, in terms of the deployment and the purchase procurement of kiosks, um, it's no direct linkage. Um, if I I, I don't know for sure, but I, I think that is to do with um, the management of the information within cybercrime, but I would need to get back to confirm that, sir. Um, however, in terms of kiosks, it's not directly linked, as far as I'm aware. So to understand, it, it, it might have some relation to information that the kiosks subse glean subsequently? No, no, sir. Um, it, it may have something to do with the overall um, digital forensic infrastructure um, that is managed um, within the cybercrime hubs. But in terms of the information that's managed within the kiosk, the information that's managed within the kiosk is solely within those kiosks. There is no data retained on the kiosks um, once a, an examination has taken place. So if data is uncovered as a result of the examination, what happens to that data? So. The, the way, perhaps, would be helpful if I, um, the way that we are proposing in our uh, policy practice procedure to use the cyber kiosks, um, as they're uh, colloquially referred to, um, within our um, local policing areas, is for if a device um, is seized by a lawful policing purpose, um, uh, and we are looking. Um, because we have seized it for a lawful policing pur purpose, we are looking to identify if there is any information, data on that, that can um, expedite or support uh, the inquiry that's under investigation. That device um, will be inserted into the cyber kiosk by one of our specially trained officers. Um, and what you can do is thereafter put in parameters of your search. So, for instance, if you were looking for specific text messages to support a domestic abuse inquiry, um, you, you would be able to put in specific uh, search parameters, um, identify to see whether that device had such um, information held on it. And if that was the case, your confirmation would thereafter be that that device supports some evidence that's going to support your inquiry. Therefore, you would then send that device for full digital forensic analysis into the, one of our cybercrime hubs within Police Scotland. Um, and is, at it the at end, that, so, sorry, sorry. is it at that point then, for instance, that, that uh, th these contracts were awarded very close together? That's, that's why this, this question arises. Is that when the evidence management system support and maintenance would then kick in? In terms of that specific contract, sir, I would need to go back and, and get confirmation on that. Okay, there's, there's another contract awarded that day, e-discovery and analytics software, and that was worth 286,000, and that was provided by a company called Nuix. Is that, how does that relate to the cyber So case? this, um, that again is another piece of software that has been procured for the establishment um, and the finalization of the digital forensic hubs that are being stood up within Police Scotland. The purpose of the digital forensic hubs is to ensure that within the northeast and west of the country, we have a systematic and corporate um, hub system that supports the digital forensic analysis of devices seized within Police Scotland. Um, items that have been purchased this year, including new XR um, tools that will be stood up within the, the hubs to assist us in our digital, digital forensic analysis of devices that are seized. These contracts, um, and, and indeed, the, Mr. Hogg, the figure you, you mentioned is uh, 75,000 more than the figure I have here, but the figure 
the, to the cumulative total of that was over a million, a million and eighty, a million and eighty-seven thousand pounds. What input did the Scottish Police Authority have into that expenditure, please? Yes, so just to clarify, the figure I gave you is uh, includes VAT, and I think that's the difference between the £370,000 figure cited in, in written evidence and the figure I gave including VAT. Um, the, the cyber hubs which have been described are part of the national cyber crime um, technical strategy, which I mentioned earlier, and that is to create three centres of expertise across Scotland to increase and modernise Police Scotland's ability to deal with all forms of cyber crime. In terms of the procurement and expenditure around that, um, that, that, that takes place within the agreed um, system of financial governance between the SPA and Police Scotland. Uh, purchases up to a certain value, Police Scotland can undertake at their own hand. Purchases over a certain threshold, which is half a million pounds, need to come to the SPA for my approval as the accountable officer for, police, for all of the policing budget. And, and beyond that, they need to go to the SPE board and indeed the Scottish Government for approval. The purchase of the 41 cyber kiosks um, fell within the category of expenditure which Police Scotland um, should procure at their own hand. The business cases for that were put through Police Scotland's own governance um, procedures and boards including the Capital Finance and Investment Board and the Change Board that happened in 2017 before the procurement in 2018. Clearly, the cumulative effect of the three would take it over that threshold, and, if, and we've heard two of them are linked. Um, how is that, from a governance point of view, how do you monitor that then? Just for argument's sake, the everything's £499,000 and lots of £499,000. I think you know where I'm yeah. going with that. Yeah, so to, to my knowledge, all the, the additional pieces of expenditure which you've referred to are, are separate from the operation of the cyber kiosks. They may together be taken and take place within the cyber hubs and they're part of the national cyber capability, but I think they are separate. In terms of the overview, the SPA um, has access to and attends meetings of the Capital Finance and Investment Board in Police Scotland and the Change Board, which approves business cases. So the SPA is cited on expenditure, even if it falls below the threshold at which it formally requires SPA approval. And were you aware of each of these contracts then, Mr Hogg? Uh, I was not involved in discussions about those particular contracts, no. OK, thank you. Stuart. Um, I just wanted to go back to the superintendent and just make sure I've understood some things that were, were, were said. The first one is the simple one. I <clears throat> took it from what you said that the data that are extracted from a device that's seized uh, and analysed in the kiosk, being for the purpose of triage, never leaves that kiosk. That data does not go anywhere from the kiosk. No, and indeed it doesn't remain on the kiosk. When you um, insert the device, you have a view then of any um, data that is held on that actual device. Um, you then identify if there is any information pertinent to the inquiry that you have under investigation. If there is, then the next step is to proceed to submit it for full di digital forensic analysis. If it doesn't, then it will be returned um, in due course to its owner. However, at the end of that examination, what happens is that the um, examination is closed down. Any data that was viewed through the window of the kiosk does not remain on the kiosk device. Um, what does remain, however, is clearly an audit trail. So there will be a unique reference number, basically so we have a form of audit and governance to understand when activity has taken place, but it will not um, retain any of the data that was viewed from that device. Right, and just the other side of it, therefore, which I think you've partially answered, is that all the data from the device that's been seized is extracted in the central facility and the processes that are associated with that are what govern the use and protection of access to that data. And you can just say yes. Yes, uh, however, I, I would like to, because um, there is another option that is available. Um, it, um, 
if, if, for instance, there is a case whereby um, whilst um, viewing the data on the kiosk, there is an opportunity to download the data of consequence onto a disk. Um, now, that is an option that is available to those trained officers. We are currently looking at how we will manage that. Um, to be clear, these kiosks are not in operation at this time. Sure, sure. Um, they, they, and the reason for that is part of the project of deployment has always been at end of procurement. We have to consider training, policy, practice and procedure. Um, and uh, as we'd be right and proper with, it, with any of these um, technologies um, that we were bringing into Police Scotland. Um, but specifically, there will be an option um, that you can download data onto a disk, but we're looking um, at the solutions for how those disks can be encrypted. Um, we've still to be fully satisfied that that will be an option, but it's something that we that is under consideration at this time. But just finally, and I really don't want to go too far with this, that would be only be in a relation to a device which has been triaged as being a device in which you would wish to take further interest. Correct, sir. Thank you. Um, Superintendent, you, you <coughs> twice now used the phrase, if I know you to collect it correctly, policy, practice and procedure. Um, I would have thought you would have wished to clarify all of these before you undertook trials where uh, you accessed 195 phones and 262 SIM cards in uh, Edinburgh and 180 phones in um, Stirling. Are you able to outline for us, and I appreciate that, that, that there may be a number of overlapping, the legislative framework that you've done that in. You say you're talking about a policy practice and procedure. What's the legislative framework and where does the independent oversight for that practice? What were the parameters of your trial? Okay, so in terms of the legal framework, are you referring to um, why we would have a device. What's the authority to take possession sure. of the phone and interrogate the phone okay. and retain the data from the phone? And who so, has access to that data and how would it be disposed of? Okay, thanks, convener. Um, in terms of the first point, there are, in general terms, four um, legal frameworks, um, for want of a better phrase, that we would bring a, a device into lawful custody. It would it re obviously requires to be for a policing purpose. So you would have your powers of common law. Um, perhaps it's helpful if I give a scenario for each of these, because it, it might certainly... Well, anyone arrested under a common law um, crime could have their phone. Is that what you're saying? Yes, sir. So that's or a breach of the peace as well. It, you can, you c could see somebody's mobile phone or other device if they are a, a, a re an arrested person. And that, that could be um, thereafter inspected and looked at. However, um, the, actually, the, the example that I was going to give is, for instance, if you had a high-risk missing person and you, um, there was clearly a threat to life, then that would be a time that we would then consider looking at that individual's mobile phone. So we have a powers of common law. We would then have powers that would exist under a warrant. For instance, if there was a warrant that had been provided to us in terms of um, the Misuse of Drugs Act 1971, <coughs> and if that gave us powers under warrant. Um, the, 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 excuse me, sir, can I just take yes, a drink no, please. of water? Please. The third would be um, your statutory powers, for instance, like I've said again, Misuse of Drugs Act 1971, if somebody was detained in terms of Section 30, 23, Misuse of Drugs Act, um, cert, so you have your statutory powers. And also you could have um, um, a, a victim of crime providing their device voluntarily for examination, for instance, in such times, whether they'd been um, the victim of a sexual or a domestic crime, and there may be information pertinent to the inquiry on that phone. Okay, now, a, 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 rough, a rough figure here, my, my sums aren't that good, but 195, 262 and 180, well over 600 devices, over 630 devices, in Gayfield Square in Edinburgh and <coughs> Stirling, how many warrants were, uh, was information acquired from? Uh, how many warrants supported the interrogation of those? Sir, unfortunately, I don't have that information. Do you have a ballpark figure at all? Uh, no, I don't. That information was not retained during, um, during the um, proof of concept of these devices. Why not? Uh, as 
from what I'm led to believe, um, during the pilot, uh, which was in 2016, the, the reason that um, the, the devices were, were trialled within two areas was to better understand their, their usability in terms of um, how the frontline officers would react and be able to use them as part of um, that proof of concept um, specific officers were trained. They were trained in the use of the device, but also provided with the, the, the training information which let them understand um, the, the framework that we've just discussed in terms of the, a device, a phone, had to, uh, prior to being um, inserted or examined on a kiosk, clearly had to have been seized for a lawful policing purpose. If they were not satisfied that any of the parameters of a lawful policing purpose had been met, then there was absolutely no reason why we would or would have at that time examined a phone on a kiosk. What, what advice was given to the owner or the person in possession of the phone regarding their rights regard to seizure? Again, there was, um, as far as I'm led to believe, um, there was no specific um, advice given to individuals. I obviously am an, um, aware of the specific conversations that occurred um, and interactions that occurred during each phone seizure. What I would say is obviously if um, a, a phone is seized by the police, um, most of the time or the own most of the time, I beg your pardon, the owner will be aware of that seizure by virtue of being present. I appreciate that would not be all the time. And the, the, the reason that we are seizing that phone is for a lawful policing purpose. So there, ha there has to be some form of um, understanding that clearly we are seizing it for a policing purpose. But as far as I'm aware, there was no specific information provided. Uh, how many people came into custody um, in both these trial areas whose phone wasn't seized? Again, sir, I couldn't answer that question. Is, but is that not vital information? Would you not want to know the percentage? Would that not gauge future workload? Would you want, not want to know the percentage of people who come across the door whose phones are seized? Again, um, like I said, the, the, the trials at the time were in terms of a proof and concept of understanding um, the technology um, and how it would be reacted to and used by frontline officers. I suppose what I would say on that point, convener, is that the devices that were examined were ones that obviously officers felt um, had been seized for a lawful policing purpose and clearly had something or what it was suspected had something to support um, their investigations. Would you be able to try and get the additional information that's been requested? Convener, uh, I, I, I will try, yes. Thank you. And, and finally, before I pass to other members, I could spend all afternoon asking you questions, but I'm not going to. Um, the, the human rights impact assessment in respect of this, a community impact assessment in respect of this, any risk assessment in respect of this, I think the committee asked that they be made available. Um, do you have any of those? They are ongoing, sir. There is a ongoing. human human rights and equality impact assessment and a data protection impact assessment ongoing. As I say, at this moment in time, we have procured, but we have not rolled out these kiosks. Um, and so that so is ongoing So the trial took part. place without any of these assessments being made? I would need to confirm if they occurred at the time, sir. I'm unaware. Okay. Um, it's supplementary, uh, Daniel. Thank you very much. I was just saying that the, these kiosks were trialled to assess the usability, usefulness of the technology. And that's why you, you and it's only subsequent to the trial that, that, that both procedure and indeed human rights impacts are being done. But what about the procedures for those people actually using them as part of the trial and indeed the human rights? I mean, given that you were trialling these things in, in Edinburgh and potentially my constituents, uh, you know, coming into contact with the use of these kiosks, I'm, I'm just surprised that none of these things were thought about just in terms of the parameters of the trial. Would they not be important that the right procedures are put in place and indeed a human rights assessment taking place for, for the trial and the people that might have their phones seized as part of that trial. Absolutely, I understand the points that you're making. In 2016, um, I need to confirm whether a, an assessment was completed or not. That's, I, I don't know. You don't know? I don't know. Um, it, so it would that be is concerning, would it not, if that, no consideration had been given prior well, to the trial? It's something that I need to go away and confirm. However, what I will say, um, sir, is that obviously as part of the training during that test case time in 2016, clearly it was discussed and it was um, 
part of the input to the officers who were were trained was in terms of that a device had to be seized under a lawful policing framework prior to examination. Can, can I just get you to clarify what data these kiosks would give officers access to, given that mobile phones these days can capture everything from where you've been through to your, you know, potentially your gate, your walking gait, your, you know, your, your relationships, um, <coughs> your so, you know, social status. What is it? That the officers will have been able to have seen and get access to using these the, kiosks as part of this trial. A kiosk, basically, um, that I suppose that the best way that um, I consider it is it's a window onto that device. So basically, any data that is held specifically on that device can be viewed via the kiosk. Okay, thank you, Ben. I understand you have a supplementary, and then it's Mark. Yeah, related to, to Daniel Johnson's question around primarily work. Uh, like Daniel Johnson, I'm a member of the Scottish Parliament for here in Edinburgh, Edinburgh Northern Leith, and I'm concerned about the lack of preliminary work that, that, that can't be clarified at, at, at this point. What uh, was done to inform people that these trials were taking place, people who came into contact with officers and any general awareness? Do you, was there... Uh, a communications campaign that took place? Were people informed when they came into an interaction with Police Scotland? Can you confirm those points? There was no specific communication made and probably the to clarify the reason for that is that there is, this is not new technology. This is technology that has been available to UK law enforcement since the late 1990s and has been um, available and has been used in Police Scotland since the start of Police Scotland. The difference is that due to the advances in that technology, we are able to now provide that facility front end. So it's no different policy. It's nothing different that Police Scotland were doing. Therefore, there was no um, specific communication made. So on, on an instance when an individual is uh, detained at, say, Gayfield Police Station, mm -hmm. well, how would they be informed of the, this process taking place with their, with their device? Well, the, the, there doesn't necessarily follow that there would be a specific communication regarding that. It doesn't follow that everybody that are, is arrested, that their device is seized and thereafter um, investigated. Um, what does happen is obviously if a, a device is seized for a lawful policing purpose because we, we think that there potentially will be some information on it to support an inquiry, um, then obviously that is when we would seize it and by seizing it, it then becomes a piece of evidence and thereafter, once it's in that evidential chain, it is thereafter viewed via the kiosk. And can I ask as well, uh, generally the experience of uh, working with Police Scotland in Edinburgh is that um, the, the Fetis are very good at informing local MSPs about uh, changes that are taking place. Sure. And I can't recall receiving any correspondence mm -hmm. on this. Is that, um, and perhaps that's because it happened earlier in 2016 than the, than the election, but it it'd be good to know was any effort made to inform elected members who might have received bits of correspondence from constituents on this, for example? Sir, I, I can certainly check that, but my um, anticipation will be that probably it was not, again, for the, the, the reason that I've just mentioned, this is nothing new for Police Scotland. This is um, a technology that we have been using. The only difference is we have the opportunity to roll that out further. And the reason that we're doing that is in terms of um, expediting inquiries, hopefully getting more devices back to people quicker if they do not contain any information to support that inquiry. And by doing so, we get those devices that do have pertinent information on them to our hubs quicker. We can therefore process them quicker. And by doing so, we're providing a better service to the public. And on that operational point, I mean, there are instances where both uh, people who've been charged and uh, victims of crime have uh, had their mobile phones uh, taken away from them for quite significant amounts of time as cases progress. Is there an operational policy intention to, for this to have some sort of effect on, on that? Absolutely, sir. I mean, 
the whole the whole point um, and the opportunity that putting kiosks front end gives us is that opportunity <coughs> to do that triage of devices so that only this those that are of significance to support an inquiry thereafter end up being processed and submitted for digital forensic analysis. At this moment in time, potentially a device could wait up to eight months to be um, examined. If we can do anything to expedite um, that by using a triage facility, we have a better opportunity um, to give a better service to the public by going, yep, that phone, that's that's got significant um, information on it. That'll support the inquiry into the hub. Note those phone phones don't and get those phones back to the people, whether it be um, a, a victim, a suspect or an accused person. Okay, thank you, that's all for now. Um, Margaret, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Um, my question is first in RTDC DS Burnett. Um, we have the Vulnerable Persons Database. That's been in, um, in operation since March 2014 across Police Scotland because there are significant concerns, I hope you, you realise, coming through about the retention of data and the appropriateness of, of what is returned. So I wonder, could you confirm if um, in the Vulnerable Persons Database there is the recording of individuals that are classified as no concern and not applicable? Um, unfortunately, I would need to defer that question. It's obviously not my area of business, um, and I would need to defer that um, f for others to answer. It's pretty germane to how Police Scotland collects data and the policy for retaining data. Now, the Vulnerable Witnesses Database, are you not familiar with that at all, DS Barnett? I'm aware of the Interim Vulnerable Persons Database. Um, I have not used it in a significant period of time myself. I work within Specialist Crime Division, and it is not a database that I am proficient or using at this moment in time, so I don't think it would be right for me to answer that question because I can't confirm well, what I can perhaps ask is the SPA, since this has gone back to 2014, and that I'm led to believe a significant portion of the entries um, are no concern and not applicable. And this has led to the Information Commissioner to question why information was collected in the first place if these entries follow under that concern. Is this not something SPA should be aware of? Is it aware of it? I don't have specific information about that particular database, but what the SPA is doing right now is upping the level of scrutiny and engagement um, around the whole area of digital data and ICT generally. And Police Scotland are currently in the process of developing a new strategy to bring together not just ICT, but the use of data and digital technologies as well. They've reached the point of producing a strategic outline business case. We, are, we've, we, want to have, we will be having a discussion at the SPE board meeting on the 31st of May about that. We also then expect that work to be developed into an, into an outline business case by the autumn, and again for the SPE to be engaging with that. All right, do you see my difficulty? It's about collecting data from mobile phones, assessing what's relevant, it's not, how you're going to shift this, is there a shifting policy, is there a deletion policy, and you've no idea how it's currently wonder, working at present under the vulnerable data base, um, under the data person's database. Surely that's the very first question you should be looking at. How do we retain data just now? What's the policy just now? If you can't answer that, then perhaps you could answer something on the proposal to establish Irish recognition and purchase the technology for that. Is that something you're aware of? Uh, yes, the SP is aware that it's something which Police Scotland are looking at. Um, I don't have the details of that. I wonder whether DS Burnett might provide those details, if you'd like. Well, perhaps it's concerning to note that there's no legal basis for, uh, for the collection of custody episodes is, uh, images, and apparently there are currently one million of these. So what concerns me in the evidence I've heard today from UDS, Barney, is the fact that you're saying after um, procurement, we'll, we'll test some policies out. 
What's being stated here, is it the, the intention before this new technology is purchased to establish a code of practice before compute, uh, procurement which should cover what's existing on the, um, on the base, whether it's legitimate to hold that, whether there is a deletion policy, whether there's a shifting policy, emerging data and any future data, that that code of practice should be in there before there's any question of purchasing this, purchasing this equipment. And an answer from both of you would be helpful. In, te in terms of um, the policy practice procedure that I've um, referred to um, for kiosks, um, that is obviously, we are, are still working our way through that. But in terms of data retention policies, they, they are policies that have uh, been uh, um, in Police Scotland and the data retention policies in terms of any data that is held within the digital forensics hubs um, anywhere else is um, for serious crime 12 plus 1, for um, other crime 6 plus 1. But to be clear again, um, Mrs Mitchell, in terms of the kiosks, there is no data retained specifically on the kiosks. If I could add to that, the, the key point I think here is that, there, <coughs> is that there is no shift in policy. As far as the SPA is aware, these kiosks do not allow the police new additional powers beyond what they already have and what they already do. Instead, what the kiosks enable is for devices to be, devices which don't need to be sent to the specialist hubs for a full forensic digital download, not to be sent in the first place. Because they're available in local police stations, people who have their phones, um, handed over to the police as part of that policing purpose can have their phones examined there and then and the police can rule out there and then whether whether or not the phone requires them to be sent off for, for a full download and the benefit of, of that is not only that the individuals who could be suspects or witnesses um, or victims of the crime not only that they get their phones back quicker but also that we then lessen the backlog of the devices stacking up in the digital hubs, which do require that download because there is a more serious uh, potential offence at the bottom of that. Can I perhaps put it another way? The, there will be data extracted from that. You say it's not kept in the kiosk. That's how it's supposed to work. The Vulnerable Witnesses database is supposed to work very differently from how it's working now. It's attracted the attention of the Freedom of Information Commissioner, if not the SPA, who is the oversight body, ironically. So can I ask if he has been involved, if you've been contacted about the proposals for the kiosk, IRIS, or any other um, data protection issues? Are you aware? In terms of the kiosk, um I have not had any direct contact um, with the Information Commissioner on kiosks. Um, however, what we are looking to do as part of our finalisation of our policy practice procedure is two things. We're looking to organise um, a demonstration event um, to which we're going to invite parliamentarians, clearly um, yourselves, um, if you wish to come along to see um, a demonstration of the device, as well as government officials and um, others from SPA who, who have not seen the kiosks to date. Um, we're also looking to establish an external reference group. Um, we, we think that's really important. Um, and obviously, um, the, the points made today reinforce our, our need to have that to ensure that we give an opportunity and we take that expert advice from um, people out with Police Scotland um, so that when we think we have our draft policy practice procedure in a place, we have that external scrutiny and eye on it so we can take that advice to make sure that when we are um, finally get to the point of deploying these devices, that we can give an assurance to yourselves and importantly to the public that we are using this technology to keep them safe but we're doing that correctly. Can I suggest you maybe do that before you formulate the policy? It might be very helpful in getting the policy right in the first place. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Two 
very brief supplementaries um, from Stuart and, and Daniel, and then we'll move on to Rona. Uh, I, think, yeah. I just ask for a confirmation, because what I'm hearing is that the kiosks extract no new information that you're not already extracting in the central processes, and I'm getting a nodding head to that. So therefore, you've got a set of processes, procedures, rules, and you've registered with the Information Commissioner your uses of the data in that central information system. And the registration doesn't say what devices you do it on. I know because, like others, I'm registered. And the other one, I <coughs> just wanted, and I got the nodding hen on that. The other one, on the vulnerable uh, persons database, can I very much welcome the existence of that? And I believe I'm probably in one of them uh, as a person of no concern. And I don't want you to remove me from that. I'm not there because I'm a criminal or thought to be a criminal, but because I'm somebody who's connected to somebody who's vulnerable, and you need to know about that connection and my being there so that you can contact me if that vulnerable person requires that. Is that a proper description of no concern? In other words, the label might be misleading us as to what's actually going on. Sir, again, apologies. I'm not proficient in the system. It's not a system that I use myself at this time, so I would not like to That's answer fine. at this point. Okay, thank you. Uh, Daniel. I'd just like you to acknowledge something. Essentially, you were saying that these kiosks don't provide you any new powers. This is technology that you've had in one form or another since the, the 1990s. But do you not recognise that the information contained on these devices now has exploded exponentially and is of a degree of sensitivity and personal nature that is just not comparable to the data captured on SIM cards, which is what you're referring to in the 1990s, and that giving officers the ability to look at that data as a matter of routine requires additional sensitivity in a way that essentially an officer having a look at what phone number somebody has on the SIM card is just a, it's a different category of information and, and level of intrusion. Would you not acknowledge that difference? Absolutely, and that's the challenge for Police Scotland and policing in a digital age. Um, we have to be able to um, police um, uh, in an age where <coughs> devices are commonplace in most inquiries or instance that we have in some form or fashion. They'll either be the device that's used in the commission of a crime or they may just have supporting information on that device. Um, so absolutely, yes, the amount of information is growing on those devices. Um, I think the public would expect us to um, have the right technologies in order to make sure that we can utilise um, any pieces of evidence and identify any pieces of, evi pieces of evidence. Um, so it's right and proper for us to identify technologies to support us in being able to work um, within a digital age. Um, your other po um, points are about the access that police will have to sensitive data. That is nothing new for the police. That is that is part of being in the police and it's part of that interaction that we will have. That unfortunately, a lot of the in interaction that we will have with members of the public will be at the most, most traumatic times of their life. We have to, on occasion through inquiries, take some really significant intimate information and details and interact with these individuals at that time. And that is something that is part of us being police officers and part of how, what we have to deal with. Um, Rona? Thank you, just before I ask my question, just a wee follow-up to, to my colleague Daniel Johnson's question. I think you said earlier that the officers could put a search in for a particular, in other words, you know, a filter in so that the other personal information wouldn't be seen. Is that correct? That's absolutely correct, yes. And are you confident that that would always be done, that in most cases that, you know, that the officer wouldn't gather up all the personal data that they didn't need? Well, to the point that Mr Johnson made, because of the amount, the huge amount of data that's on a phone, um, the search parameters being there are absolutely there in order to make sure that if you are looking specifically for text within a timeline, you can do that. Can <coughs> I guarantee that that will be done on every occasion? No, because to be honest, it depends what inquiry is under investigation, what data would potentially be pertinent to that inquiry. Okay, thank you. Can I then go on to ask you um, whether um, staff associations and unions were consulted before the trials took place? 
I can't speak to before um, the trial's taken place. However, what I can say is, um, as part of the 2026 briefing strategy, um, Cybercrime Capability Programme is one of those programmes of works with the cyber infrastructure project sitting underneath that. We briefed um, to Scottish Police Federation and the Police Staffing Associations at um, the autumn of 2017 and actually gave them a demonstration of the kiosks at that time. And were there any concerns raised by them? None whatsoever. They fully supported it. They could see the efficacy of it. They could see how it would support um, us to be more efficient in our processes and it, they could see how it would really support individuals, um, especially in terms of victims, um, expediting those crimes. Okay. I may have missed this earlier. Are the trials still going on? No, no. So they're finished. So has there been some form of formal um, evaluation done and on what's actually... You know, is there going to be a report about what you've learned and things like that? Or? So the, there was a couple of reports, um, brief reports that were um, completed at the end of those trials. Um, and we also, um, prior to moving to procurement of the devices at this time, we liaise with um, a significant amount of forces within England. Um, as you'll be aware, um, these devices are used throughout the UK um, and a lot of police forces and have been for a significant period of time. Um, the reportage coming back, absolutely, you need to make sure your training, your policy, your practice procedure has to be robust. But the, the, the message coming through loud and clear as well was, if you do introduce these within the right environment, then they can do nothing but assist you in giving a better service to the public. Have you, have you, can you give us any feedback? so far received on how the trials seem to have, have went amongst your amongst the force again um, in terms of um what we saw um the reporting was that the submissions into the digital forensic hubs um, decreased dramatically i can't provide specific figures on that um, but there was um um, reported that there was a, a dramatic decrease and therefore that meant that those crimes of significance that were within um, the hubs could um, be expedited as well and it, it basically lets our specialist forensic examiners get on with those cases that really need that that level of input. Okay, no problems highlighted then with the actual procedure, the practical side of it? There was none highlighted, no. Okay, all right, thank, thank you. you. Uh, Superintendent Burnett, uh, are you familiar, you talked about liaison with other forces across the UK. Uh, w was one of them North Yorkshire? I'm aware of the report from North Yorkshire convener, yes. Are you aware of the Police Complaint Commissioner's report, investigation into North Yorkshire? Yes, convener. And are you, so, for instance, that, as I understand, concluded in half the cases sampled, there was a failure to receive author authorisation for the use of phone extraction tools. Poor training resulted uh, um, in practices which undermined the prosecution of serious crimes such as murder and sexual offences. Were you aware of that? Yes. And that there was inadequate data security practices, including the failure to encrypt and files which may contain intimate details of people never charged with a crime are lost. Was any um, data lost as a result of the trials in um, Stirling and Edinburgh? No data was reported lost, sir, no. And with regard to the trial, you said there was a couple of reports. Could you make these available to the committee, please? Yes, I can convene and, uh, Mr Hogg, are you able to say if the, the police authority was cited in either of these reports and what its response was, please? I don't know whether or not the reports were shared um, with the SPA, but I do know that there was subsequently a briefing given by Police Scotland um, to the members of the authority in September of 2017 in advance of the procurement exercise beginning and that provided an opportunity for the members to ask questions that they had about the proposed use of the kiosks and to seek uh, um, the assurances that they wanted to um, get. Thank you. If there was a copy of that briefing or any presentation that was made that would be helpful if you could make that available to the, the committee as well please. Um, Stuart, uh, have you next? Uh, no. No, okay, thank you. 
Uh, Liam, you, you, you uh, want to... Yeah, this? thanks. And can I start by <coughs> apologising for my slightly late arrival? I was kept uh, in the chamber for a, a debate I was taking uh, part in. Uh, and apologies <coughs> if some of this was covered in the exchanges that I, I missed at the start. I, I think, like <coughs> Daniel Johnson and, and, and Ben McPherson, I'm slightly concerned about um, the, the what appears to be a lack of preparation um, ahead of the trials taking place. And I mean, I, I accept the point about um, uh, the perceived benefits of having this technology, a technology that is already used but is being deployed further up the chain at the, at the, at the front line. Um, I, I think, uh, uh, Des Barnett, you, Barnett, you said um, it's nothing new uh, and, and that the public would expect um, you to be de deploying the technology. I suppose the concern would be that when you, you move this closer to the, the front line, the extent to which it is being used will will grow exponentially as well. And therefore, the numbers of people um, that would need to have the, the requisite training um, to be able to, to, to uh, carry out these functions appropriately um, would, would expand, um, if not exponentially, then significantly. Um, and therefore, I'm, I'm slightly concerned that um, this was just assumed to be not really a departure from what was already happening, um, when actually it is in the sense that it's it's requiring a good deal more officers um, uh, to be uh, cognisant of um, the, the the sensitivities around handling the the data, um, and that that should at least be appearing on a risk register. I would have thought. So in terms of them being cognisant of managing that data at this moment in time, the. the um, to, prior to any use of a kiosk, they would still have that data um, because what you've got to remember is we, if the device is of significance, it's put into the cybercrime hub. There is a, a download of that device done. Um, data is identified um, and thereafter provided back to the inquiry officer for them to look at. So they but, but, but Sorry for interrupting, but in a sense, if, if you know that you're going to have to move this up the chain to the hub, um, and, and that is the only way of, of, of um, being able to access the, the, the data. Um, you're going to take a view of whether or not um, that is, is uh, essential or necessary as part of whatever inquiry you're undertaking. If you're able, in a kiosk, uh, through one of these kiosks in, in the station, um, to, uh, to identify that da data there and then, then it is going to be far more attractive. I, I think the, sort of the, the cost-benefit analysis that you will do as to whether or not this is worth going down is going to be very different uh, from what it has been traditionally, where it's being sent to the to the hub. So you're going to get an increased usage as a result of having these these kiosks in, in place. It's going to be used in instances that it is not being used uh, at present. Through the SPA's involvement in oversight of the procurement of these devices, what I can say is that the procurement included a training package. So included in the cost I mentioned earlier was a, 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 a sum of money to in effect train trainers in Police Scotland in recognition of the very point that you're making. If you have more people operating devices, they all need to be trained are trained, they all need to be trained appropriately in using them, and therefore that's been taken into account. And the other key point is linked, that links to that is that at the moment, um, our understanding is that devices are, are sent to these hubs where there is a, a less discriminating download of the data. What these devices, these so-called kiosks, allow for is more parameters to be set. So for the first time, you've got devices being examined within a narrower search set of parameters than currently takes place when the devices are sent um, out. But the training point has been taken account in what's been procured so far. And in terms of, of, of any decision around wider rollout, um, uh, what further safeguards are, are being considered in terms of either data protection, uh, human rights issues, um, I, 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 a gamut which presumably have, have, have come up already because the technology is being used in, in other areas, but if it's been used more extensively by a wider range of, of, yeah. of those within Police Scotland, then presumably there'll have to be another analysis done to make sure that those safeguards yes. are appropriate or remain appropriate. 
I think this is where the importance of the standard operating procedure comes in, which uh, DS Burnett referred to earlier. The intention is that the, the procedure to be established for their use be consulted on by be given to the external expert reference group for consultation before it's developed so that the so that concerns or um, questions about privacy and data and usage and consistency can be built into the operating procedure there is as 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 matters stand just now that there, there is not an agreement to roll these out um, rollout will not happen until the issues which you've been raising are addressed, including through that external expert group. And the external expert group, is, is it self-contained or is it itself receiving um, submissions from, I mean, the, the committee has received a number in yeah. advance of, of, of the session yeah. today. Is that reference group inviting those organisations that have been in touch with us and, and perhaps others uh, to be submitting views? Um, ahead of uh, any decisions that they're taking. Yes, my understanding is that, for example, Police Scotland intend to invite Privacy International to be members of that expert external reference group. Right. And, and just to confirm, at, at this stage, there is no even ballpark time frame for, for rollout? Um, do you yes, have a set there, a date? Yes, there is a, a, a plan. So this, as I mentioned earlier, comprises part of the implementation of the Policing 2026 strategy. Um, at the moment, the intention is to engage with this group over the summer and, the, and then to work up the standard operating procedure to allow rollout in the autumn. But that's, that's not the same thing as saying there is agreement at this stage to, um, to do that. Agreement would only follow um, once the group has done its work and once the procedure has been put in place. Daniel, you had a... a, a yeah, I've just got a, a technical question. Before I do, I mean, I had wanted to ask you about how this fits in with IT strategy, given that the IT strategy hasn't been signed off yet. Could you maybe uh, get back to the subcommittee in writing just uh, with the, the details of that IT strategy and how this uh, procurement fits in with that? That would be useful. Can I also just note that I think it's unfortunate that you're quoting figures ex VAT, given that Police Scotland can no longer recover VAT from its... Uh, can you just make sure that that doesn't happen again when you provide information? I'm sorry, I was yeah, quoting yeah, figures. Yeah, I was... Yeah. Well, it, well, the VAT position has changed, so therefore you're, you're quoting VAT and ex-VAT numbers. It's just confusing, is my basic oh, point. Um, can I ask... So finally, just on a very technical point, I mean, my understanding is that uh, some phones, if users set them up correctly, have very sophisticated levels of data encryption, which even the FBI cannot crack. Indeed, when I look at my phone and look at the, the relevant things, it's saying that data protection is enabled, which and I'm guessing that that would mean that if I submit my phone that these kiosks wouldn't work, and, doesn't, and, and more importantly, am I right in saying that encryption essentially would mean that these kiosks would not really be able to find anything from these phones? Is that right or, 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 or incorrect? So at this moment in time, as, as you have already alluded to, technology is changing all the time, devices are changing all the time, um, different people have different devices that have different security setups on them. Um, there is certain amounts of devices that um, are set up with security and if we are able to plug them into the kiosk, we will still be able to access the data on, on those devices. Um, I, the, the, the list of those devices clearly changes all the time in terms of how technologies is. But all Apple iPhones and Android-based phones, which is the vast majority of smartphones, have as part of their operating systems the ability to encrypt all data. So, th And I'm assuming that savvy criminals, serious criminals, organised criminals, know all about that. So I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that really that this gets the people that are just less savvy and more kind of occasional or... Uh, Daniel, I, I don't is that correct? Daniel, I, I don't know that we necessarily want... I, I, I think uh, the Police Scotland will be able to extract the data. I think it will... From an encrypted phone? Yes, I beg your pardon, you, but, but by all means, answer if you wish. Um, what I would say, um, convener and um, Mr Johnson, is that kiosks are part of a suite of options available to Police Scotland and UK law enforcement. You, you're, you're right, you've alluded to the fact that we, ha we are challenged um, 
as every law enforcement is in policing in a digital age, and that is something that we have to look at. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Ben, will you want to? Yeah. Just briefly, just uh, on the uh, kiosks themselves and the capacity of the machines, you, you, you mentioned that no data is retained on the, the kiosks. Um, and you answered the point from the convener about data loss. I just wanted to check uh, if there's any capability in the kiosks to delete information that are on devices. Not as far as I'm aware. Okay. It'd be good to, to get clarity on that, because I think... Absolutely. That, that, that certainly was the view of the Police Complaints Commission and Investigation that that was a possible consequence. Okay. I'll, I'll get that confirmed, convener. Because that, that would have different consequences. Clearly. Yeah. Uh, if, if I may, convener, I think the Information Commissioner was perhaps making a different point about data on the kiosk, whereas I think Ben was asking about data on the, the, um, the, device. the device. There were right. different points, is really all I'm saying. Okay, okay. We can see it's a very clearly technical area. Um, a, few, a few questions to yourself. Um, Superintendent uh, Burnett, um, what discussions has Police Scotland had with the, the Crown Office, the Lord Advocate, about uh, its use of this equipment? Okay. So back in 2016, um, prior to commencement of the testing of the devices, um, there was consultation with the Crown Office um, to um, confirm, because obviously the purpose of us um, utilising kiosks is to secure um, any evidence that can expedite a crime. So there is no point us um, considering that in isolation. We need to um, understand um, that Crown Office are supportive and comfortable with the use and the, the, the seizure of evidence in that way. And they were supportive of the trials. What they did say was that at that time, um, due to it being a, a new use of the technology, that they would support their use only in summary cases at that time. But we have continued in consultation with... In summary Crown, cases? Summary cases. That was at the time during the trials. Um, we have continued in consultation with okay. Crown Office so. since then, and they're aware of our procurement, and they are supportive um, of our use, and they are supportive of kiosks being used um, for the, within the lawful framework, which we discussed earlier. Okay, thank you. Likewise, would you be able to share that co correspondence with the committee, please? Absolutely. Thank you very much indeed. Two, two other quick points, and, and I think you alluded to, alluded to these statuses yourself, uh, Superintendent, and that is, as I understand in Scots law, you can be a witness, a suspect, and an accused. That's the status of, of, of everyone. Um, does anyone in that group have the right to say you're not getting my phone because you talked about interrogation? And we would all understand domestic violence, vulnerable persons, missing persons, and, and where there's a pressing need for life. Um, would you maybe like to write to us who can and can't refuse to, to hand over their phone, please? Of course. Well, um, a, a witness can clearly um, refuse to provide um, any... Are you talking about providing the device or yes. providing... Um, a witness clearly um, could, could refuse to provide a device in order to expedite any inquiry in terms of suspect or accused, as you referred to, um, a phone would need to be seized under a lawful purpose, the ones that I discussed earlier. Okay, thank you. And, and finally, if I may, please, in your state, or in the Police Scotland report, I have to say many, uh, it's not what you'd call in plain English, um, I, I wouldn't say, or I had difficulty with the phrase in relation to all of this, the design principles under planning are planning, emphasise an approach what would modular Iterative and agile. <coughs> I'm an old-fashioned bloke. That um, <coughs> doesn't make much sense to me. But what I, I have to say did jump out at me was where there was mention of an equality and human rights impact assessment and private impact assessments before operational deployment. And we've covered the bit that, that, that your trial wasn't supported by any of these documents. But we're not putting the cart before the horse full stop here. Because what if that human rights impact assessment said there were implications and we've already had that expenditure of a million pounds? Kavina, I think where we are is um, because um, we use this technology anyway, um, we are aware of its um, use and efficacy throughout um, 
UK law enforcement. We absolutely understand the need and the requirements and we are completing those assessments and we will build in any of the findings of them. Um, I would anticipate um, that there will be nothing that will come up in those assessments that we cannot address clearly if there is something that means that we have to stop absolutely that is something that would need to occur okay i, I think uh, there, there were opportunities to to fully reassure us on these matters i have to say personally and i, I understand others might not be so we will discuss this as part of our work program and may well uh, come back to you both in in writing but uh, in the interim if you could send the committee the the papers they've alluded to that we've requested that would that be very helpful and can I thank you both for your evidence? Thank you very much. Thank you, Convener. Thank you. And we now move into private session.